Okay, welcome to this very exciting brief whirlwind tour through the special senses. And our study aim should ha say, or the, our study aim says that you should understand the basic functioning of the special senses in humans. So we're going to stick to the basics and try not to make things too complicated. And our special senses are vision, hearing, smell, and taste. So uh, we're going to start off with vision, which is probably the most complicated special sense, uh, and then hearing, which is uh, slightly less complicated, and smell and taste, which are relatively um, less complicated compared to um, the other two. And we start with vision. So very briefly, going through the anatomy of the eye. Um, we have our cornea, our lens. Our lens shape is altered by the ciliary muscle uh, for focusing um, nearby objects. The lens has to be widened for focusing on far off objects. The lens has to be allowed to thin out and the ciliary muscle regulates the size of that lens. Our eye is filled with jelly, the vitreous fluid and the retina is the part of the eye that is capable of vision and the part of the uh, retina that sees the best is the fovea centralis over here which has got the most um, has got the highest density of uh, visual receptors so light has to come in through here and has to um, focus on this small little point uh, so bear in mind that this massive amount of vision in front of the eye has to be basically compressed uh, in order to become a little dot that sits on the fovea centralis. So we divide vision into sort of an optical component and a neurological component. So that um, component, all those components that take this entire vision of the world in front of us and compress it in a tiny little spot on the fovea centralis. Um, all those components are referred to as the optical components and our three major components. Uh, the aqueous humor, which is the fluid around the iris and lens, uh, which helps to focus the light somewhat. The lens, which is the most uh, sort of important component, um, which is composed of transparent lens fibers and the ciliary muscle alters the shape of that lens for focusing. And then the vitreous humor is a jelly-like transparent substance which fills up the eyeball um, and that in and of itself also focuses the light somewhat, but the major component is the lens. And just briefly to let you have insight into this, uh, we've got this big image. The image is compressed so they can land in the fovea centralis, but due to the way the um, lens works, the lens works by bending light. Where, um, through this process of light bending, the image is swapped around. So uh, the image that presents on the fovea centralis is actually upside down and flipped left to right. The brain, however, will reflip it um, um, in the occipital lobe. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's actually projected as a tiny little upside down left to right image on the fovea centralis. So all of this stuff comes in and is compressed in this tiny little image over there. Now the neural components of vision consist of two components, the retina and the optic nerve. And the retina is a layer at the posterior part of the eye that actually floats freely at the back of the eye. Um, however, it's anchored at the optic disc and the uh, anterior margin and pressure from the vitreous jelly usually keeps it flat against the choroid. So um, the problem is because it's not that firmly attached to the back of the eye, we can have a phenomenon called retinal detachment where the retina starts tearing off the back of the eye. The other thing is that if you have a stab wound to the eye, for example, and all that vitreous jelly leaks out, um, the retina might also detach or, or not function correctly because it's not properly pressed back at the ba uh, against the back of the eye. And the part of the retina that sees the most is the fovea centralis. And, um, just off the center of the retina is the optic disc. Uh, so all the nerve fibers of the retina um, will eventually converge on this optic disc. And this optic disc in and of itself does not have any um, 
vision cells or uh, of cells capable of vision and therefore it's actually a blind spot and part of the advantage of the, fa uh, of the fact that it's a blind spot is that blood vessels can enter freely through the optic disc and not really um, mess up your vision now technically speaking in the per peripheral vision uh, where vision from your optic disc is should have been um, there are two blind spots one left one right and technically speaking you shouldn't actually see anything in those blind spots but your brain uh, automatically photoshops uh, your vision so that you don't actually notice the blind spot um, but there's a little uh, test coming up on the following slides that will prove to you that yes you do actually have uh, a blind spot so let's do a quick experiment to prove to ourselves that we have a blind spot what you need to do is if you're standing in front or sitting in front of the computer you need to close your left eye and you need to stare at that R right over here so stare right here and now move your head closer to the R and closer and closer and at some point you'll realize while you're staring at the R that the L has disappeared from your peripheral vision and if you zoom in close so move in closer to the R it L will suddenly and almost magically reappear in your peripheral vision and the reason the L disappears is because at that point the image of the L is falling on your optic disc and your optic disc cannot change that into um, a visual signal uh, and therefore there's actually a hole there in your vision your brain automatically photoshops the hole by um, coloring it th uh, the same color as the surrounding uh, imagery which is why um, it looks like the L disappears into this sort of white um, spot um, but yeah that is your um, blind spot and you can do the same thing uh, with the other side if you close your right eye and you stare at the L and you move in closer eventually the R will disappear and as you move in closer the R will magically reappear and uh, if for whatever reason this trick um, doesn't this experiment doesn't work for you uh, you can also check out um, this website you can copy and paste that uh, into your browser and that has a s um, slightly easier experiment to do to prove um, the existence of your blind spot okay so how does the retina work um, basically uh, light goes into the eyeball falls onto that retina especially the fovea centralis and the cells there called photoreceptor cells and we have two types we've got the rods and we've got the cones rods are designed to function in low light levels and um, they also only respond to shades of grey cones work better in brightly bright light uh, settings and they can also pick up various colors uh, the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells in and of themselves can also detect a little bit of light although they mostly detect light intensity um, so if you if someone shines extremely bright light into your eyes it's the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells that give you that sort of feeling of pain from that intense light being shown into your eyes there's other cells as well um, in the retina uh, so this is just the, the most obvious cells but the cells for edge detection um, some cells are just for light intensity perception the cells for contrast um, the cells that regulate the rods and cones and um, for the sake of this lecture we're not going to go into um, all of those um, different uh, cell types and receptor types um, I think it's just too much information if we had to go into all of them um, I've noticed that um, there's also cells for depth perception and for texture uh, recognition men tend to have better uh, or tend to have more depth perception cells so they're a bit better at navigating through three dimensional space or uh, driving a car and reversing that sort of thing um, so th that that partly helps with them and then women are better at um, texture recognition um, so they tend to have a lower tolerance of dirt and uncleanliness uh, because they can see all the little specks of dirt uh, quite easily um, whereas uh, um, men 
do not see that intense sort of texture from the dirt um, and it's, they're not as bothered by it as a rule of thumb and yeah we all have a unique composition of rods and cones and all the other cells so we all tend to see the world in a slightly different way and we're going to discuss color blindness um, just now and if you're color blind you actually see the world in a very much different um, kind of way so we don't all see the world exactly the same okay so here's a rod um, consists of various segments as you can see the outer segment has got membranous discs that have contain rhodopsin rhodopsin reacts with light uh, specifically low level light um, and then we've got the inner segment of all our organelles and mitochondria and we've got about 130 million of these rods in the retina and at the end of the rod we've got the neurotransmitters that are released now we've got cones which are more for bright light and colors they have a different shape instead of having a sort of d uh, cylinder with a membranous discs within it we instead have a tapering sort of cone uh, with uh, parallel infoldings of the cell membrane and uh, there's about six and a half million of them in the retina and they contain instead of rhodopsin they contain photopsin I've got a bipolar cell, so a rod or a cone is sits on top of the bipolar cell and then um, underneath the bipolar cell is a ganglion cell and um, the rod and the bipolar cell or the cone and the bipolar cell work as a unit so in the presence of light the bipolar cell stimulates the underlying ganglion cell the ganglion cells um, are large neurons in the retina and they're actually the beginnings of the optic nerve um, and all these ganglion cells usually receive signals from several bipolar nerves they then receive the signal and then um, the signal goes down the axon and then all the different ganglion cells of the retina all hook up uh, their axons at the um, optic uh, disc forming the optic nerve and that optic nerve then goes off to the brain so you can actually um, think of it as being um, direct extensions actually of the brain because there's, there's a direct connection between the ganglion neurosoma and then if you go down its axon it then synapses in the brain so it's almost as if it's an extension of the brain itself um, and that's why looking at the optic disc can sometimes give you clues um, as to what's happening in the brain if there's a lot of pressure in the brain that pressure will sometimes transfer through the optic nerve and then start damaging the retina so signs of um, increased intracranial pressure might include signs in the eye if, uh, if you see if you do a fundoscopy and you look at the back of the eye and there's little hemorrhages and the optic disc is swollen the, um, then it might be because of pressure from the brain going down that um, down that optic nerve and pressing against the retina. Uh, some ganglion cells can detect light, and they detect light in order to regulate the pupil size. So they have um, connections with the brain stem, um, such as the brainstem nuclei, especially the superior colliculi, um, and that will uh, then they then there will then be connections from this uh, from the brainstem to the ciliary muscle um, helping it control the pupil size unfortunately um, these ganglion cells only regulate pupil size and they do not have direct connections to the cerebrum and therefore contribute absolutely jack to um, actual vision and there's about one million of them um, and if you've been paying attention to the numbers of the rods and cones we ha mostly have rods in our eyes and then um, uh, second biggest group is the cones and now we've only got a paltry 1 million ganglion cells uh, so we have about 140 photoreceptors for each ganglion cell which means that uh, about a, uh, in the presence of light 140 cells will be punishing this one little ganglion cell telling it hey there's light okay so in order to detect light we need pigments uh, we, in other words, we need molecules with a specific color. That color uh, will allow it to absorb a certain frequency of light more effectively. And when it absorbs that frequency of light, it will start to vibrate. And with increased vibration, you'll then have start having chemical reactions. So we have the visual pigments. 
rods have rhodopsin, uh, which is a bit purplish, so it's also called visual purple, and this particular molecule will vibrate more in the presence of uh, gray spectrums of light, um, at l and they're also able to vibrate quite a lot, despite the fact that they have very little light stimulation, so they're able to vibrate at low levels of light, giving us a little bit of light vision, or rather low light vision. Um, cones have photopsin, also known as iodopsin, um, probably because they're a bit brownish, but uh, also because they also have the iodine molecule in, and they will react at different um, frequencies of light depending on the particular nature of the photopsin. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Sensory ganglions, those that are able to detect light for light intensity monitoring, they have melanopsin, uh, a black pigment um, that uh, will vibrate, um, especially with intense light. Okay, so we're going to first look at how rods work. Rods work in partnership with bipolar cells and it's a very complicated relationship uh, it's really not worth learning, it's not clinically relevant um, we can summarize it by saying that the rods in the bipolar cells work as a unit the rod um, gets the light information and then uh, the bipolar cell will then send the signal to the ganglion cell so they work as a team and that's all I need you to know regarding the relationship um, in the presence of low light, the right bi rod bipolar cell um, unit activates. And how does it activate? Well, the rods have rhodopsin. Uh, rhodopsin consists of cis-retinol, which is made from vitamin A, and a molecule called opsin. And that retinol is very sensitive, and it um, is very easily um, altered by light. Just a little bit of light energy can cause it to vibrate and transform into a new shape. So even with a little bit of low light, um, that retinol uh, transforms into transretinol, and in that transformation it breaks away from the opsin. That um, opsin that has been freed from its retinol cage triggers off an energy cascade uh, through cyclic GMP and this uh, leads to a whole complicated cascade of events but the moral of the story is that eventually bipolar cells are activated and they secrete glutamate and they activate the underlying ganglion cell. The retinol and the opsin are then recycled to make new rhodopsin um, and that rhodopsin will then, um, if there's still low light, will then once again break apart into transretinol and opsin and over and over again. Moving on to how cones work, which is a bit more complicated because we have multiple types of cones, um, but the same as how rods and bipolar cells work as a unit, cones and their underlying bipolar cells also work as a unit. In the presence of bright light, uh, the cones and the bipolar cells uh, they're attached to will work um, as a team and activate the underlying ganglion cell. Now instead of rhodopsin, they have photopsin, and there are three types of uh, these sort of photopsin molecules, uh, therefore three types of cones. you got cones that respond mostly to short waves of uh, light uh, energy, uh, which is mostly blue light uh, uh, spectrum light. Um, you have uh, cones or photopsins that react uh, mostly to medium wave light energy, uh, which is going to be mostly green light, and we have cones that respond mostly to long wave light energy, um, which is going to be mostly your red light spectrum um, of light. So remember, light is a form of energy. Um, it um, has a waveform that you can measure. Uh, if the waveform, uh, if the light energy is very rapid and comes in very rapid bursts, we, it's uh, going to be a short wave. Uh, if the light sort of moves in lazily, uh, alternates um, in energy forms quite lazily, then it will be a long wave. Um, now certain types of light, certain uh, waves of light can stimulate more than one receptor, so there is a bit of ov uh, overlap between what types of light the cones can uh, respond to. And when, when there is an overlap and different cones are stimulated uh, by the same type of light, uh, it then causes a mixture um, 
um, of uh, signals and those mixtures produce colors so technically speaking we only can see three colors blue green red uh, but through the mix mixing um, of the signals from these three base colors uh, we then have all the other different types of colors um, that formed now, if you have an abnormality of these rods, you'll then have be color blind. And there's various types of color blindness depending on whether you're missing one or two of the different types of cones. However, the most common um, color blindness um, is uh, loss of your long wave cones, meaning that you mostly just see blues and greens, and um, because of the similarity between spectra uh, wavelengths between green and red, um, people who've lost one of these cones uh, will be unable to tell the difference between green and red. It can also happen because you've lost your medium wave cones and then you'll mostly see the world in blue, blues and reds. But the most common is the loss of the ability to see red, uh, which is of most commonly called, called red-green color blindness. Um, and um, just as a point of interest to make it more um, vivid for you, uh, dogs and cats um, only have two types of cones. Um, they do not have long wave cones. They do not see red. They do not see orange. They do not see yellow. They do not see purple. Uh, to see these colors, you either need a long wave cone or you need long wave cones working um, with the other cones to make a mixture um, to make the color. So dogs and cats are red-green colorblind, and remember, if you're throwing a red ball on a green lawn, um, that the green lawn and the red ball are actually exactly the same color for your dog. Uh, and if the dog is, f you force your dog to chase a red ball thrown on a green lawn, um, they might struggle to see the ball, and they'll uh, end up being forced to sniff for it. Another uh, interesting point, Mark Zuckerberg, the guy who created Facebook, is also red-green colorblind um, because he cannot see so many of those colors. He cannot see red, orange, yellow, purple. He deliberately designed Facebook to have the colors that he personally sees best. Um, his personal sort of retinal makeup is dominant in the short wave cone, so he, he's v he can see all blues very nicely. Um, uh, he sees blues the same way as other people see blues, it's the other colors that he struggles with. So he deliberately decided to make Facebook blue so that um, when he looks at Facebook, he knows that um, what he is seeing is more or less what other people um, are seeing. So um, it's, uh, it's not difficult for him to make design changes in Facebook because he doesn't have to worry about what, the, uh, uh, what um, colors he's seeing and what colors he can't see. So just to give you an example of color blindness, um, I put um, this picture through a color blindness simulator and notice that the reds and the greens kind of um, become indistinguishable. Uh, we have a nice red here, nice green here, and the colors actually end up sort of looking quite similar. I mean. Uh, people of color blindness can still sometimes um, see the different shades, um, but I mean it's all green. It's all transformed into green. So this is how the color blind person would see the world. And notice also that it also destroys some of your other colors, and it destroys a hell of a lot of variety of colors that you see, um, because so many of the colors that we see are actually mixtures of three different types of cones. Just taking out one of the cone basically wipes out 30% uh, or even more um, of your, uh, all the possible colors that you can see. So the entire world becomes a sort of murky um, sea of greens and blues. And it's definitely not nearly as vibrant as for a person who has all his um, color cones. This gives colorblind people various problems um, with certain jobs that require you to be able to see all those different varieties of colors or be able to distinguish between intensities of color. And um, it also makes one well, common complaint among colorblind people is that they struggle to, to dress well um, because then um, 
they're unable to properly match different colors or what looks like it matches well uh, to them uh, to a person who has a full range of color it actually looks horribly mismatched so some color blind people uh, always go shopping with a friend um, that has a full color spectrum in order to make sure they don't buy stuff that's completely uh, mismatching if you want to have a look at some other examples um, of uh, this type of color blindness and also the other variants of color blindness, please check this link. There's a couple of photos there that um, compare normal color uh, with the different types of color blindness. Okay, just some practical points uh, regarding the eyes. For people that have two eyes, not everyone has two eyes, but most people have two eyes, um, there are two sort of practical matters of note. First of all, um, you need two eyes in order to be able to see in three dimensions. Um, those two images basically combine and the brain converts into, th into a three-dimensional picture. Uh, that ability is referred to as stereoscopic vision. So obviously people with only one eye will have trouble with depth perception. And um, um, thus will struggle a little bit with tasks such as driving and visual spatial tasks. Although usually um, they can compensate, they do learn how to compensate after a while, so they can still, uh, most of them can still drive, even though they only have one eye. And then some animals also um, do not have eyes that will sit forward in front of the face, they have eyes on the side, so just as an interesting side note, um, that your typical horse, for example, does not have accurate depth perception, or not as accurate as humans. Uh, related idea is convergence. Um, you have two eyes that can take two separate images and the brain has to take two images in order to make one picture and in order to do that the eyes usually have to try and focus on the same spot and when the two eyes are on the same spot the brain can easily merge the two images and that phenomenon is called convergence it is a problem with convergence for example if a muscle weakness uh, um, of the muscles around the eye on the one eye or some other problem preventing the um, proper movement of one eye the, uh, or proper convergence then we're going to have diplopia which is double vision uh, the brain is unable to make one clear image because each eye is focusing on a separate point and you end up seeing double okay so we've gone into detail on how the retina works now let's discuss how those signals end up in the brain so we've got our first order neurons uh, those are the bipolar cells and they fire off and they synapse with ganglion cells. So this is actually the beginning of the visual projection pathway. Just that one bipolar cell is a first order neuron after it's stimulated by a rod or a cone. Second order neurons are the ganglion cells uh, with very long axons that all join up together to make at the optic disc to make the optic nerve. Uh, so we're still at second order neurons now with the optic nerve entering the skull through the optic foramen and then it goes to the optic chiasm and at the optic chiasm it does something quite funny it joins up with the opposite optic nerve and then partially splits uh, to the left and right sided fiber which I'll show you on the image in the next uh, few slides these fibers then go to the thalamus and the midbrain where they synapse they go to the midbrain uh, to activate certain visual reflexes um, and they go to the thalamus um, in order to be routed into the cerebrum for consciousness of that vision so carry on from the thalamus uh, we've got our third order neurons that go um, to the occipital lobe and we refer to those third order neurons as the optic radiation from the thalamus and the region of the occipital lobe that receives these neurons is referred to as the primary visual cortex then after that we've got our fourth order neurons and so when signals reach the primary visual cortex um, images will then form um, and then the brain then has to send those images to the correct parts of the uh, um, brain in order to um, orientate ourselves in terms of what we are seeing and where we are in space relative to what we are seeing which is done there by the parietal lobe um, we have to decide how we feel about what we are seeing and um, that's done by the temporal lobe and w uh, if we need to remember what we are seeing that's done by the temporal lobe and eventually signals will also go on all the way to the frontal lobe to decide what to do about what we are seeing um, but um, those centers that sort of um, process that visual information 
first are called the secondary visual centers uh, in the parietal and temporal lobe. And if there's damage to the parietal lobe, for example, um, even though you can technically see uh, something, uh, you might not be able to be consciously aware of it without a functioning parietal lobe um, because you need the parietal lobe to take those images and actually make you conscious of those images in relation to yourself. So um, even though if everything else is working properly without a functioning parietal lobe, um, even though technically you're not blind, you're unable to be conscious of what you're seeing and then it's, as if it's the same thing as if you are blind. So let's have a look again at the wiring, as it were, of vision. We've got our bipolar cells in the retina being our first order neurons, the synapse of ganglions, and then we've got second order neurons. Now, of note, can divide the eyeball into two, and um, as you can see, the stuff on the left side of the retina, all those ganglion cells sort of join up together and stay together, whereas the guys on the opposite side will tend to split up. So we've got the second order neurons forming the optic nerve, this is optic nerve, and this is the optic chiasm. Now they split into uh, right and left. So um, basically, um, everything from the left side of the eyeball will go to the left occipital cortex same over here this guy is going to end up going to the left occipital cortex and everything from the right side over here and over here is going to end up in um, the right cerebral hemisphere cerebral cortex but let's follow along with this side so um, the left this is the left side is going to um, carry on um, down this uh, left uh, optic tract. It's going to be joined up with the left retinal ganglion uh, axons from that side and they're going to join up there. Some of them are going to um, synapse at the brain stem. Um, oh, there's the brain stem, superior colliculus, and then they're going to synapse with various nuclei in the brain stem in order to alter um, things like focusing and pupil size and that sort of thing. The rest are going to synapse in the thalamus and from the thalamus we have the optic radiation, our third order neurons that synapse at the primary visual cortex and that in a nutshell is the entire visual projection pathway from retina to cortex. So now, as I said on the previous slide, everything that falls on the r left side of the eyeball is going to end up being at the left occipital lobe. However, remember that the lens swaps the image around before it lands on the fovea centrala and on the retina in general. It flips left to right and it goes upside down. This has certain repercussions in the sense that the left side of the retina receives images uh, from the right side of the eyeball. So this image is then flipped over and then plastered over on that retina. And the right side of the eyeball receives images from the left side. So if we, uh, we divide our eyeball in half, then we're going to have two visual fields uh, going into that eyeball, one on the left side, one on the right side that right visual field is going to end up in the left uh, occipital lobe and the left visual field is going to end up on the right uh, visual cortex over there. And the same for this eyeball. Which means that if I um, stab you in the one eye, so let's stab you in, uh, in this eye and you only got this eye left, Everything from the right, towards the right side of the eyeball, is going to go to the left um, occipital lobe. Everything from the left side is going to end up at the right um, occipital lobe. Um, now, what the happens is that because we have convergence, because these two eyeballs are generally focusing on one point, um, the sort of halfway point through the eyeballs, um, if we had to draw an imaginary line dividing the eyeballs in half, that imaginary line when our pupils, when our eyes are focusing on one thing, 
will join up together at the one spot, uh, allowing the brain to take these four visual fields and combine them um, into one image. This has certain uh, repercussions um, in terms of if uh, where you have lesions in the optic tract. For example, um, if you have a lesion over here, um, you're going to end up losing both your left visual fields and each eyeball will only be able to see the right half uh, of vision as an example. Other issues are that um, because different visual fields are being processed by each occipital lobe, um, they need some signals need to be sent between the two parietal lobes through the corpus callosum um, in order to quickly integrate all the different visual fields together into one image. And certain people with severe epilepsy have a operation uh, that c cuts the corpus callosum and uh, with the result, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but th they develop a split brain where they struggled integrating uh, information from the different visual fields between the two parts of the uh, cerebral hemispheres because the corpus callosum has been severed and the cerebral hemispheres cannot communicate with one another. Now we're going to discuss the special sense of hearing. So what is hearing? Hearing is the ability to interpret sound waves, which begs the question, what is sound? Um, sound presents as waves. Basically, it's energy rushing through the air. And as it rushes through the air, it causes the air to sometimes be squished, and now it's compressed, and sometimes it blows up the air, causing it to expand. And, that, uh, and it tends to do that in a pattern of compression, expansion, compression, expansion. And that compression, expansion, compression, expansion, compression, expansion um, is considered to be a wave. Now, if that um, squishing and blowing up happens very quickly, um, we call it a high frequency uh, wave. Um, and these are generally interpreted by the ear as being of high pitch. And if that um, squishing and expansion uh, happens very slowly, that's a low frequency, and we interpret that as a low pitch. Frequencies are measured per second, in other words, in hertz. And generally, we hear frequencies the best between 1,000 to 3,000 hertz. Um, but the ear, uh, depending on person to person, um, is capable of picking up anything from 20 to 20,000 hertz. So um, anything from 20. Um, uh, squishes and explosions per second to 20,000 squishes and explosions per second. Now, um, frequency is merely how quickly um, the air is squished and then expanded. Um, however, if the um, compression or the squishing is very intense and the blow up afterwards is very intense, um, um, as we increase that intensity, uh, we say that it increases in amplitude. So it's a difference between um, a tiny little squish and explosion and a massive squish and explosion. And the more massive um, the squish and explosion, the greater the amplitude, the more louder we interpret that uh, sound. And we measure loudness in decibels or rather we measure the amplitude of sound in decibels. And most conversation uh, occurs at a level of about 60 decibels. And uh, usually if we push uh, sound above 80 deci decibels, we start to cause hearing loss by damaging our delicate organs of corti. And a typical uh, music concert ha or typical club scene will have music over above 120 decibels. And I also think most people that listen to their iPods and things typically crank up the volume to above um, uh, above that level as well, which is why even though they were listening through headphones, when you're sitting next to them or walking next uh, past them, you can still hear that <coughs> scratchy sound uh, from their um, headphones. And I'm surprised that no one has sued the manufacturers of these headphones or sued uh, the organizer of the concerts yet for hearing loss. Um, since it's a known cause of hearing loss, uh, technically an uh, iPod should come with a warning label um, that this can cause hearing loss. And concerts should also come with warning labels. And they don't come with warning labels. It's only a matter of time, I think, before someone sues um, uh, these uh, sort of products and, ex and concerts uh, for hearing loss. 
Okay, so we've established what sound uh, is, that sound wave of uh, explosions and uh, squishiness uh, hits uh, the tympanic membrane of the ear, the tympanic membrane vibrates, that vibration is then transmitted through three bones, the malleus, incus and stapes. Um, these bones inc um, become increasingly smaller one after the other and that's, that serves to sort of intensify uh, the vibration of the sound. Now when the sound hits the tympanic membrane of the ear basically it causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate and that basically transfers to transform sound vibration to mechanical vibration. So by constantly shrinking the structures the mechanical vibration becomes more and more intense. That mechanical vibration then hits the oval window, and the oval window vibrates. Um, now, on the opposite side of the oval window, we have the um, cochlea, which is filled with fluid called perilymph. With the vibration of that oval window, um, the fluid um, in the cochlea starts uh, vibrating, so then we have a fluid vibration. And that fluid vibration initially goes through the perilymph of the vestibular duct. and um, as that fluid wave travels in the vestibular duct of the cochlea, some of it crosses over into the cochlear duct, which is a duct buried within the vestibular duct. And there's different cells in the cochlear duct that vibrate um, according to the frequency of the vibrations that are transferred uh, through the fluids. And that specific frequency is sent as a nerve signal to the brain, and the brain then reconverts it from uh, fluid vibration into a uh, sound uh, vibration um, sort of interpretation and we hear it as sound. If there's too much sound or too much fluid waves they travel in and out and they exit um, via the uh, round window and are dispersed into the inner ear. Okay, so let's go through the sound process uh, step by step. We've got a sound wave. It's collected by our pinna. The pinna funnels it into the ear canal. And then the sound wave hits the tympanic membrane and causes it to vibrate. So we have um, transformation of sound energy into mechanical vibrational energy, which then goes through um, malleus and the incus and the stapes. Notice that the bones get smaller and smaller as we go along, basically concentrating the energy uh, into a tinier and tinier sort of um, field. Then we hit the oval window and it starts vibrating and then vibra um, this mechanical vibration is then transferred into fluid. This perilymph um, so it becomes fluid vibration and it vibrates and it vibrates. Now <coughs> The um, basal membrane here in the cochlear duct starts out as very thick here at the beginning. And these vibrations cannot, um, uh, unless they are very um, sort of low frequency, they're not able to penetrate it very easily. The um, membrane does thin out the further you go in the cochlear duct, so high frequency vibrations are able to cross over from s uh, one side to the other. Um, a bit further on. But the point is that they cross over, they go on to the other side eventually, and then they come out the round window to be uh, dispersed. Now what happens with hearing, in order to be able to hear, when this uh, vibration crosses through the cochlear duct, it um, knocks against the organ of corti, and um, by knocking the membranes of the organ of corti, um, uh, basically causing those membranes to vibrate, um, signals are generated are sent to the brain. But we'll discuss that in more detail on the next slide. So discussing the organ of corti, the organ of corti uh, consists of hair cells and support cells, and these hair cells have lots of little cilia on their apex and refer to them as stereocilia. Now, this organ of corti sits on a basal membrane and is partially con covered by a tectorial membrane. Um, and both these membranes are quite flexible and they easily vibrate as and bend as those fluid waves cross over uh, and through and uh, over them. 
and what happens basically is that as those fluid waves cross over from the vestibular duct, cochlear duct and back into the opposite vestibular uh, duct, uh, these membranes vibrate and with the vibration actually knock against those hair cells or more specifically they knock against the stereocilia and when they're knocked against the stereocilia, the stereocilia bend and when they are bend, uh, bent, um, ion channels depolarize um, potassium and calcium enters the cell and that calcium then um, causes uh, an action potential to build up which eventually causes vesicles uh, to be released and these vesicles are full of neurotransmitters and there are neurons sitting just underneath the hair cells in the presence of the neurotransmitters they themselves depolarize and the signal is sent um, to the brain now something to take note of is that the basal membra membrane is uh, much stiffer near the um, oval window and it thins out further on as you go. So high frequency sounds are able to penetrate it quite early on. Low frequency sounds are uh, struggle to penetrate that thick basal membrane and they can only penetrate later on which means that the different parts of the ear are specialized for um, different frequencies of sound, which is uh, an important sort of fact um, to understand if you're ever dealing with a patient with a cochlear implant, but I'll discuss the cochlear implants a little bit later. Okay, so if we had to cut that cochlear transversely, this is what we'd see. Um, we've got our vestibular ducts here and here and our cochlear duct here, and what happens is that we have fluid vibrations here, and they try and cross through here into this part so that they can escape out of the round window. If this membrane is too thick um, um, and the frequency of the vibration is too high, they'll have to move further along the cochlea before they can cross over. Um, otherwise, low frequency vibrations can cross over easily even if it's a thick um, basal membrane. And what happens is that when the vibrations cross over, they knock against the tectorial membrane over here and they cause this basal membrane to vibrate as well. And as they vibrate, they start knocking against each other. And on the top here, on top of the basal membrane, we've got all our um, hair cells, our stereocilia, and as they bang against um, the tectorial membrane, uh, sound signals are generated and they are sent uh, through to the brain via the underlying nerve. Okay, so once those nerves leave the, um, the basal membrane, what happens? Well, they join up um, and they form the cochlear nerve. And that cochlear nerve joins up with the vestibular nerve on the vestibulum to make the vestibular cochlear nerve, otherwise known as cranial nerve 8. We won't go into the function of the vestibular nerve um, that carries signals for the control of balance. We're going to focus more on hearing. But um, let's carry on. So this vestibular cochlear nerve um, then goes to the pons and it's um, synapses at the cochlear nucleus of the pons. So that's easy. Cochlear, vestibular cochlear nerve goes to the cochlear nuclei at the bottom of the pons. And then this projection goes up to a synapse with the superior olivary nucleus in the pons. And there are some nerves coming from the superior olivary nucleus projecting back to the cochlea and uh, to the muscles that control the tympanic membrane um, and the stapes bone. And that allows the tympanic membrane and stapes to slightly alter the dense, uh, their tension. And therefore you can actually fine tune the um, signals coming in uh, by altering the slackness or the tension of the tympanic membrane and the stapes. At the superior olivary nucleus there's also the extensive decussation um, allowing the two ears to um, um, connect to one another to allow binaural hearing. Uh, otherwise the nerves project to and synapse the inferior colliculus and the brain stem. Uh, that places the sound in a three-dimensional uh, space. So the inferior colliculus, uh, part of its function is to um, figure out where in three-dimensional space sounds are coming from. It also presses pitch and it also controls sound-initiated reflexes just as a startle response. So if someone uh, gives you a sudden shout and you jump, uh, you can blame your inferior colliculus. 
from the inferior colliculus we go to the thalamus uh, and from there it goes to the primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe and there we become aware of the sound and from the temporal lobe it then has to project to other parts of the brain so that we can react to uh, the sounds that are coming in or it has to go to language centers such as Wernicke's area so we can convert the sound into language uh, there's massive decussation of the nerve tracts and um, it doesn't. It only, it's only partial decussation, uh, so some of the nerves still stay on the ipsilateral side, and therefore it's um, both hemispheres, both left and right hemispheres, control both ears to some extent, which is why it's quite rare um, to have deafness forming um, from a stroke, for example. That's um, a that's because um, even if you have a stroke of the one primary auditory cortex, say on the left side or the right side or what have you, um, the other auditory cortex can often keep um, taking signals from both ears and therefore you will not entirely lose your ability to hear. Okay, so let's go through the auditory projection tract um, on this image. So we have all those little nerves from all those little basal arm membranes joining up to make the cochlear nerve which becomes the vestibular cochlear nerve which then synapses at the cochlear nucleus at the base of the pons. Remember the pons and the midbrain are um, very much specialized for the functions of posture and that was the uh, function of the spine and for hearing and for vision and for control of the face. So it makes sense that um, it would uh, these signals would go straight to the pons rather than down into the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata um, evolved before ears evolved so it wouldn't have any functions for hearing. Alright and then those signals have to go up to the superior olivary nucleus. Uh, apparently it looks a little bit like an olive and that's why it's called olivary and then we have lots and lots of decussation. Um, so part of this nerve will decussate to go on this side and part of it will stay on the ipsilateral side. Therefore, um, if in order to go deaf in this ear, you will, if you have a stroke here in this pons area, uh, you might go deaf in this ear. Um, if you have a stroke over here, for example, in the midbrain, um, even though the tracts are broken to the one side, because of decussation, you still won't lose hearing on the one side. Alright, from the superior livery nucleus, there's some feedback um, nerves, specifically going to the tympanic membrane and the stapes, which are not pictured on this image, but they control the tension um, of those um, of that tympanic membrane of that stapes bone, um, allowing for a bit of fine tuning when it comes uh, to sound. If sound is too loud, um, the tympanic membrane and the stapes can slacken in order to reduce uh, the intensity of the sound coming in. If the sound is not loud enough, uh, they can become more tense, um, more, uh, they, come vi they vibrate more easily, and uh, you can almost am you basically amplify the sound a little bit. So we do have a little bit of control in, t in terms of how intense the sounds are coming uh, how intense the sounds are coming into the ear. Okay, going up, we then go to the inferior colliculus. Also controls some reflexes. So superior livery nucleus controls reflexes that go into the ear. Inferior colliculus controls slightly more complex uh, reflexes, such as being able to uh, reflexively understand where in three dimensions that sound is coming from, and also for startle response. And then. Um, we go off to, um, well, on the other side that happens as well. And there's also decussation fibers in the midbrain. So there's a heck of a lot of decussation. You can cut off the decussation here and there'll still be decussation fibers here. So you really have to do some serious damage to the brainstem before you're going to um, disrupt the ability uh, of the ears to hear. And then we go to the thalamus, or the thalami, thalami, because it's on both sides, and off to our primary auditory cortices, which are at the superior margin of the temporal lobes, basically um, at the border of that lateral sulcus of the brain. 
Okay, so just to uh, emphasize where the primary auditory cortex is, it's over here, superior surface, uh, or superior margin of the temporal lobe at that um, lateral sulcus. It's nice and close to Wernicke's area, so there's projection pathways allowing for rapid interpretation of sound into language. It's close to the frontal lobe, so um, you can make a rapid decision uh, about what to do if what you're hearing is actually the roar um, of a wild animal that is about to come and hunt you. So you can quickly decide whether you can stand and fight or run away like a chicken. Okay, so let's um, give you some clinical insight into how the cochlea works. Um, generally, most cases of hearing loss and deafness are due to damage of the stereocilia, um, and as the sensory hair cells of the organ of corti. But the cochlear nerves underneath the hair cells are usually intact. They're just lacking something to stimulate them. And um, it was found that if you stimulate those nerves directly, even in the absence of stereocilia, you'll end up hearing something. Um, and so, um, basically, through the decades, um, certain surgeons experimented by sticking wires into the cochlear duct and st uh, stimulating cochlear nerves to try and make sounds. Eventually those wires were connected to microphones so that they would only um, stimulate um, the cochlear duct <coughs> in the response of, uh, of a sound. The initial one, initially they didn't realize that the different basal membrane, uh, that because the basal membrane is thicker at the beginning, the beginning of the cochlea is actually for low frequency sounds and that the end of the cochlea is for high frequency sounds. They didn't realize that at first. And so they'd um, stick an uh, electrical impulse through that wire, and uh, people would basically just hear <coughs> um, They weren't able to differ, uh, because the, the cochlear implants didn't properly differentiate between the frequencies, it was just that what they could hear was noise, uh, which for some deaf people was still better than nothing. They could at least hear a car um, hooting at them if they um, um, be um, just before what would otherwise have been an accident, for example. But uh, the technology improved and improved, and once it was realized that the basal membranes are specialized for different frequencies, they changed the wires so that um, different frequencies would, would only um, activate the wires at certain segments um, of the wire. And as microphone technology improved, that also helped. And um, Basically, modern devices are designed so that uh, the microphone will pick up a specific frequency of sound and only stimulate a specific part of that wire, stimulating only a certain part of the cochlear duct um, so that uh, it mimics the natural frequency distribution of frequencies uh, through the cochlear duct and they're getting better and better um, at uh, giving almost near natural hearing um, for these patients who would otherwise uh, be deaf. So you'll often notice these patients um, uh, with um, little device, uh, little microphones. Sometimes the microphones are, or well, technically speaking, the microphone can be put anywhere, but usually the microphone is mounted into the ear, and then they'll often have a little um, little receiver uh, on the uh, scalp, uh, so they're proper little cyborgs. Um, and uh, the microphone in the earpiece sends a wireless signal into the. Um, receiver and that uh, that receiver is connected directly to the wire which is drilled through the skull and into the cochlear duct. Um, these devices are becoming more and more sophisticated uh, to the point that um, the receivers can actually receive input from any microphone. Um, so what's happening now is that the receivers can also receive Bluetooth signals or wireless signals from a cell phone. Uh, so that now, um, if you phone someone with one of these uh, newer cochlear implants, uh, they don't even need to put the phone next to their ear. They just receive the call. It goes directly into uh, through the receiver into their ear, so they can actually. Um, um, they don't even need to put the cell phone up to their ear um, because it's being beamed directly into their heads, which I think is pretty cool. Let's move on to smell. Okay, so um, we smell mainly in the top parts of our nose, the superior nasal mucosa, and because of that, it's also referred to as olfactory mucosa. The inferior nasal mucosa doesn't have any smell function whatsoever. and there's about 10 to 20 million olfactory cells buried in this olfactory mucosa, and they're actually nerve cells that are specialized to be able to react um, to um, different chemicals in the air. And how do they react? Well, they have um, 10 to 20 cilia, 
um, and these cilia are also referred to as olfactory hairs, and each hair has a binding site for a specific chemical. Um, and humans have about 350 different receptors on these um, cilia. That's 350 different receptors. And the different smells that we experience are due to um, different combinations of these receptors uh, being stimulated. And each olfactory cell might in fact have a uh, various combinations of these receptors giving us all the various sort of different uh, fragrances and mixtures um, of smells that we can experience. An average human can smell about 350 different smells. Some people smell less smells, some people have more smells depending on how many receptors they have and um, because the receptors can basically mix and match uh, that also means that um, humans tend not to have the same sense of smell from person to person. Uh, in fact, some people claim that uh, smell receptor uh, makeup is about as unique to every individual as our fingerprints. So no two people, unless you have an identical twin, no two people have the exact same um, makeup of uh, smell receptors. Those um, cilia, those olfactory hairs, only live about 60 days, but uh, the olfactory cells constantly growing new ones and replacing them. And just to uh, give you some, some visualization of the olfactory mucosa, they're in the superior part of the nasal cavity. So the process of smelling, well first of all we have to have a chemical to smell which is referred to as an odorant. The odorant enters the nose and there are two types of odorants, the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, uh, the hydrophilic odorants can very easily dissolve into the mucosa and they bind with the receptor right then and there and cause that olfactory cell to fire off a signal that goes to the olfactory nerve. So no issues there. Hydrophobic um, odorants have a bit of a more complicated um, Root. They have to bind to an odorant binding protein, uh, which is which, and these are proteins are present in the mucosa, and they cross over into the mucosa after binding with these proteins. Once they've activated the receptor on that um, olfactory hair, ion channels are opened up, uh, specifically sodium and calcium, uh, in the uh, olfactory cilia, and that causes the nerve to depolarize, and that um, depolarizing causes the depolarization causes an action potential. That action potential travels along uh, the axon, the olfactory nerve axon, and enters the skull through uh, a bone called the cribriform plate. And, not s and, and soon after crossing into the skull, it synapses with a big uh, mass of um, nerve tissue called the olfactory bulb. So basically the primary nerve is at olfactory um, nerve and now we're into the secondary nerve starting an olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb um, is basically the beginning of the olfactory nerve and so it sends a signal down the olfactory nerve to the primary olfactory cortex of the brain which is on the inferior surface of the temporal lobe. Um, take note that this is one of the few cranial nerves that has um, absolutely no connection via the thalamus. It has a direct connection to the temporal lobe, which suggests that the process of smell, uh, or the sense of smell, is a very ancient um, sense that is even more ancient uh, in evolutionary history than the thalamus. So it had to develop a direct connection because the thalamus hadn't really evolved yet in our ancient evolutionary ancestors. Okay, and then from the primary olfactory uh, cortex, there are lots of um, uh, secondary tracts. Uh, so these are all our tertiary nerves, and they go on to the hippocampus um, so that we can um, um, have feelings about what we are smelling. Uh, the amygdala also uh, um, has emotional input. The insula um, is primarily involved in altering um, our taste uh, in response to smell. Um, so that's uh, so the insula is responsible that if you're very hungry and you can smell some food being cooked, your mouth starts uh, salivating and you start feeling very hungry. That's your insula's fault. Um, and the orbitofrontal cortex where we decide what we think about uh, these smells. 
There's also some feedback nerves from those uh, before mentioned areas directly to the olfactory bulb, and it can actually reduce or increase the uh, activity of that olfactory bulb, um, which also explains why food smells better when you're hungry. It's because the insula has um, feedback into the olfactory bulb and forces upregulation of olfactory bulb activity, causing the smell become more and more and more intense. Not all smells are smelled through the olfactory um, nerve. S um, the trigeminal nerve is also able to um, uh, react to some um, odorant molecules, and these are generally your painful smell sensations. Uh, the smell of ammonia, uh, the smell of menthol, if you had to spray menthol directly into the nose it would burn a bit. Chlorine, um, if you've ever swum in a pool and got some chlorine into your nose, that's that vague, irritating, burning sensation. And uh, capsicum, which is um, chili pepper, uh, I'm sure you would be very unhappy if someone sprayed pure chili pepper uh, or pepper spray into your nose. So these um, smell molecules that in a high enough concentration can be painful are actually um, controlled by the trigeminal nerve and it's those for ammonia, menthol, chlorine, capsicum, everything else is controlled by the olfactory nerve. Okay, so looking at smelling um, pictures we ha let's get a little odorant molecule here and it's floating here and it's floating floating and whoops it gets sucked into your nose and uh, diffuses to the uh, superior nasal mucosa and if it's a hydrophilic molecule it goes right there into the cilia where it bonds with a receptor if it's a hydrophobic molecule it needs to bind with a protein before it finally gets to the um, cilia and then finally causes depolarization which causes an action potential to go all the way down the axon uh, past the crib reform plate. Um, it's a bone at the base of the skull with lots of little holes in it and so the axons go through the holes and then synapse in the olfactory bulb and from the olfactory bulb we then have olfactory tracts that go directly into the inner surface, the medial surface of the temporal lobe um, which is the primary olfactory cortex and from there it's got all those projection tracts to all the other parts of the brain. And now we're going to discuss about t taste. Okay, so the tasting um, organs of our tongue are the taste buds, which are scattered all over the tongue, and uh, they consist of different types of cells, uh, basal cells at the base, sustentacular cells, which are there for support, and then the actual taste cells, the gustatory receptor cells. And the gustatory cells have microvilli that project into a pore, um, and that pore is at the surface of the tongue so that chemicals can fall into that pore and then taste can be, um, and then those chemicals can activate taste receptors. Now each of those taste buds have to have nerve fibers to take signals from the taste bud to the brain. Each taste bud has about 50 nerve fibers um, uh, plugged into it and these nerve fibers also multitask um, uh, themselves. The, um, each nerve fiber innovates about five other buds and new buds are constantly growing and replacing the old ones. Um, so old ones die off, new ones come in. Um, if the nerve supply is cut off for whatever reason, say there's trauma to the tongue, um, all the blood supplied by those nerves will immediately um, die off. Uh, but um, t uh, the nerves in the tongue are quite hardy and can regrow, and once they regrow, uh, buds will spontaneously start to come back. So if a patient has trauma to the tongue and uh, has lost his taste, it ma there's a good chance that the taste will recover once those nerves regenerate. So taste buds are on papillae. Um, so there's little bumps on your tongue and those bumps are papillae and on each bump is um, a lot of taste buds. Um, not only that are they located on the papillae of the tongue but they're also located in the mucosa uh, specifically the epiglottis, the palate and the pharynx so we do have some limited ability to taste um, on the mucosal surfaces of the oral cavity not just on the tongue but in mostly taste buds are located on the walls of the papillae of the tongue and there's two, type of two types of papillae the fungiform and the valate fungiform um, are the round uh, round uh, papillae. They're more numerous towards the front of the tongue and um, they only contain up to five taste buds per little bump on the tongue. 
the valets uh, papillae are much larger, they're more uh, towards the back of the tongue, they have a dome shape, and they contain about a hundred taste buds each. And all in all, if we had to count all the taste buds in their mouth, you, uh, a person has plus minus about 10,000 taste buds. Now those gustatory cells um, are divided into different types. They're specialized to um, have a specific taste and there are five known taste receptor types that those um, taste cells can uh, engage in. Uh, sweet, sour, bitter, salt and um, savory taste, uh, better known by the Japanese name umami. It was a Japanese who, uh, who discovered that receptor type so their name for it stuck. And this is in contrast to smell. If you remember, with smell there's 350 different receptor types, whereas with taste there's only five uh, confirmed receptor types. We do believe that fat is also a taste type. Um, we know that adding a little bit of fat to something makes something taste more creamy and changes its taste. Um, that's why coffee tastes so much better with a little bit of milk in. Um, but as yet we've been unable to uh, clearly identify the receptor um, for that sixth taste type. So um, it's still basically a, r uh, a race among scientists to discover exactly which cell in the oral cavity is involved with fat taste perception. Uh, it might be that there is no cell involved with fat taste perception, but we strongly suspect that it exists. And therefore the different tastes of food that um, we um, experience when we eat food is actually created by combining all the signals from these six receptor types. So depending how the receptors are stimulated, we'll uh, experience a wide variety of different um, tastes. And as I mentioned, the receptors are present on the microvilli of the gustatory cell. Alright, so on the tip of those taste cells, um, they have their microvilli and they project into a little taste pore on the top of the taste bud. Uh, so it's a little hole basically in the bud and chemicals can go into the pore. Now uh, in the same way with smell, uh, chemicals that we can smell we refer to as odorants. So, um, chemicals we can taste we refer to as tastins. So tastins can enter the pore, bind with the correct receptor, whether it's sweet, sour, salty, bitter or umami uh, or fat and um, then the taste cell will depolarize. Calcium enters the cell and various reactions happen at the uh, end plate. Um, for sour taste cells, they release serotonin, which act then activates the underlying nerve and sends a signal off to the brain. Other taste cells are, are quite different, uh, besides the mysterious fat taste cell, which, which we are still tr struggling to discover. Um, but um, sweet, bitter, and salt, um, and umami, um, instead of releasing a neurotrans traditional neurotransmitter like serotonin, they release ATP, adenosine triphosphate, uh, the energy um, storage molecule and that energy storage molecule degrades to ADP and then uh, gives uh, the underlying nerve a bit of a kickstart when the energy is released and that way the uh, nerve, the underlying nerve activates. So it's an unusual way of two nerves um, or two cells communicating with one another that exists uh, with these taste cells instead of using a neurotransmitter they communicate directly with ATP. So just to give, uh, explain to you in a picture, we've got our tasted molecule and it comes and it, uh, it um, docks with a receptor on the microvilli and then there's depolarization and um, in the actual sort of taste bud there's uh, lots of calcium rich tissue and that calcium floods into the membrane allowing that action potential to travel all the way down. If it's um, a sour taste cell it releases vesicles full of serotonin to activate the underlying nerve. So one of the other ones they just release ATP which directly stimulates the underlying nerve and sends a signal off to the brain. Alright, so when that uh, underlying nerve is activated in the taste bud, where does it go? Well, it depends where the nerve um, originates from. From the anterior two thirds of the tongue, it goes via the facial nerve, um, or to the facial nerve via the cordi tympani. Uh, from the posterior third of the tongue, it goes via the glossopharyngeal nerve. Everywhere else goes to the vagus nerve, so that includes the palate and the pharynx and epiglottis. And these tr all these tracts. Uh, taste tracts from these nerves unite and they synapse in the medulla oblongata at the solitary tract nucleus or nucleus tractus solitarius. 
and then after that they go off to the thalamus and from the thalamus they go to the postcentral gyrus um, and also the insular lobe and these two guys then handle um, how um, the awareness of the taste and how you feel about that taste so let's go over again um, the um, nerve pathways uh, from tongue to brain we start off with um, cranial nerve 7, facial nerve, um, so it's vital cordy tympani, uh, glossopharyngeal nerve from the posterior third of the tongue, uh, vagus nerve from uh, palate, uh, pharynx, epiglottis, everywhere else, um, and again just to emphasize, the facial nerve is from the anterior third of the tongue, and it goes to the medulla oblongata which so shows that taste is a very ancient um, sensation, uh, one of the, probably one of the first um, sensations to develop along the evolutionary tree and therefore the oldest part of the brain, evolutionarily the most oldest, um, is uh, the part of the brain that is involved, intimately involved uh, with taste um, input. These um, from from the tr um, solitary tract goes straight up to the thalamus, and from the thalamus um, it then goes to um, the precentral gyrus and also the insular lobe. Now just to backtrack a bit, now you see this arrow that's crossing across here. Um, that's representing the cassation. Um, there's no sort of standardized decussation pattern for these tracts. Um, these, um, the taste tracts uh, do partly decussate in some people. So what happens is that in, uh, there's a strong inter-individual uh, variation in how these tracts decussate. Um, it seems that in some people the tracts completely decussate so that everything from, for example, um, the right side of the tongue will end up in the left side uh, of the brain. Uh, in some people there's no decussation, so everything stays on the ipsilateral side. Uh, so if you have a stroke here of your precentral gyrus, you then lose sensation of half your tongue. And in some people there's partial decussation, so both parts of the brain control both sides of the tongue. So if you have a stroke here, you will not lose all sensation uh, in the tongue because it will just go over to the other side uh, of the brain. So that's why there's a question mark here, um, just to show there's no standardized decussation pattern for the taste tracks. varies very much uh, in people. Uh, it seems to partly decussate in most people, but in some people it does not decussate, and in some people it completely decussates, leading to a very variable pattern of how these tracks um, swap sides in the brain and therefore very variable results of having a stroke um, of your um, postcentral gyrus or your insular lobe. You might end up having um, complete loss of taste sensation in half your tongue or half your palate or what have you and or uh, you might have absolutely no loss of taste sensation despite an extensive stroke. So that's just to emphasize that um, signals coming in from the opposite side of the tongue. So this um, solitary nucleus basically takes signals from half the tongue and then the other half uh, and half the palate and so forth and then the other half comes in through the other side um, following the same pathway. And um, again, uh, the mysteries of the decussation. Uh, classically, it's, uh, it was thought that they don't decussate at all, that each half of the brain controls half the tongue. Um, different uh, victims of stroke had such varying uh, clinical um, fallouts, though, that we realize that this is cannot, that this is not true. There must be some decussation in some people. My references.